All right. Good morning, everyone. We are going to get started on our webinar. Uh, welcome to Seeing the Forest and the Trees, Meet Your Forest Pests. So my name is Delena Arnold. I'm the Education Programs Manager for the Georgian Bay Biosphere. Thank you very much for joining us on this webinar on this beautiful sunny day. We're going to jump right in. Um, at this point, I imagine most of us have participated in a Zoom webinar. But just in case, I want to start by pointing out the Q&A question and answer tool um, is at the bottom of your screen. If you wiggle your mouse a little bit, you'll see some options. Q&A is one of them. If you have a question at any time during the webinar, please put your question in there. We'll be answering questions about midway through the presentation as well as at the end. Um, we're not going to share our screens during the presentation, so don't worry if you can't see us. And uh, I want you to know, too, that we will be recording today's webinar and we're gonna upload it to our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, tomorrow we'll send out a follow-up email that'll have a link to the video and any resources that we mention in today's presentation as well. So as we wait for a few more people to join us, I'm gonna quickly share a little bit about the Georgian Bay Biosphere. Uh, we're one of 18 UNESCO World Biospheres in Canada. Our region is ecologically unique with the largest freshwater archipelago on earth. So the biosphere stretches 200 kilometers from the Severn River to the French River and it was designated in 2004. We are a registered charity with our office in Perry Sound, and we rely on grants, partnerships, and donations to do our conservation and education work. And since 2014, uh, the Township of the Archipelago has held an active partnership with the Georgian Bay Biosphere to provide environmental programming to ratepayers. So this has included a range of things from water quality monitoring to forest health work, guided hikes, kids programming, and in 2020, it includes webinars. So we'd also like to acknowledge the land before we begin. The Georgian Bay Biosphere is situated within the treaty territories of Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850 and the Williams Treaty of 1920, and it is located on Anishinaabek territory. Our organization under UNESCO acknowledges the rights of indigenous peoples and in this territory and works towards respectful and re reciprocal relationships as we are all caretakers of the land. The final piece before we get started, we'd like to know who's joining us today. Um, one of our presenters, Margaret Scott, is going to open a poll and we just want to know um, what municipality your seasonal or permanent residence is in. Um, you should see it appear on your screen there and you can simply select what applies and click submit. And we'll give everybody a couple seconds uh, to put some answers in there. Where are you calling in from? Maybe about five more seconds. Anyone who's just joining us, we're just asking where your seasonal or permanent residence is in. A simple click and submit. All right, Margaret, why don't we close the poll and share the answers? Where is everyone from? Oh, nice. Lots of archipelago, lots of seaguin and other. That's great. Nice to see we're getting a good reach. All right, uh, I will now turn things over for the rest of the presentation to Westwind Forest Stewardship. We have Barry Davidson and Margaret Scott joining us. Hello, Barry and Margaret. Okay. Um, Thanks, Delena. So today we're going to be talking about a few forest pests and diseases. So just to give you a sense of kind of how things are going to run, Barry's first going to take you through talking about gypsy moth and beech bark disease. We're there going to take a break for questions. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about forest tent caterpillar, emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adalgid, and oak ilt disease. And then we'll stop again for questions so that you have a chance to answer, ask any questions you have about those pests that we talk about. So to start us off, Barry Davidson, who's a registered professional forester at Westwind Forest Stewardship, um, and also the forest manager, is going to start us off with gypsy moth. Good morning, folks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the GBBR for having us here and for all the attendees taking some time out of a beautiful day to listen in on us. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to, uh, to be available for uh, fashion advice if you want to copy my uh, ensemble in the photo there. Um, sporting my camouflage pants and uh, red plaid 
coat in and uh, blaze orange accessories, but uh, this is being recorded. Maybe you could uh, use it for later. Next slide, please, Margaret. Okay, first, before we get going, um, need just to introduce who Westwind Forest Stewardship is. Westwind Forest Stewardship holds the Sustainable Forest License for the French Severn Forest. So that's just the Crown land. It's basically the Perry Sound District, um, Georgian Bay to Algonquin Park, and from about French River roughly down to approximately the Severn River in the south. So we manage the Crown land in that area when it comes to forest management. Our forest management includes uh, silviculture, uh, all planning requirements, and also compliance activities to make sure operations, whether harvesting or silviculture related, comply with all the uh, rules and regulations set out that must be followed. Westwind, a uh, fairly unique company in Ontario, if not Canada, we were the first large public forest in Canada to be certified under the Forest Stewardship Council or FSC. And that happened back in 2002. Uh, we're also a not-for-profit company, and we are community-based, we're governed by a community-based board of directors with industry, community, and Indigenous uh, representation on the board. Next. So one of the things folks may have uh, been hearing a lot about lately or seeing some things about lately in our own properties uh, or driving down the highways, uh, has to do with gypsy moth. The Latin name is Lamantria dispar. Uh, gypsy moth, it's a non-native invasive species. There are a couple of different uh, varieties of them from, uh, there's European and Asian. Uh, generally, we're dealing with European in Ontario. The damage done from the gypsy moth is defoliation of trees. And this occurs only at the caterpillar or larval stage. The gypsy moth came to us from back in the 1860s uh, uh, in Massachusetts. There's an individual tried to corner the market on some new silk industry uh, idea, and it was an experiment that went wrong. Uh, they escaped into the neighborhood, and we've been dealing with or uh, through the uh, Northeast US and uh, ever since. Next. So just to give you a little life cycle of what uh, the gypsy moth is all about and starting from the upper left corner of the slide. Um, this insect overwinters as an egg or is in a cluster of eggs. Uh, basically it can be 100 to upwards of a thousand eggs in a cluster and they're in a, they're in a buff colored uh, coated egg mass. They hatch in the spring as larval or caterpillars and you can see they're fairly unique uh, or very distinctive uh, with series of both blue and red uh, pairs of dots running down their back. They uh, go through six instars. Basically what that means is they, they have those stages where they grow into their new skin um, six different times and with each instar or each stage they become larger and larger, and as they become larger, their appetite increases. The top right uh, picture is uh, a, a, pupa, a pupae. It, they pupate in sometime in mid to late July. I think this year what I've been seeing, it's probably more into the mid part of it in the month we we're seeing those, and they hatch out as moths sometime into later in July and even into early August, depending on the year and where they are. Um, the white uh, or cream colored larger moths are the females and they do not fly. Instead they send out a pheromone, a chemical scent, and the more dully bre male, male brown moths, um, they follow the pheromone scent and uh, find the female and when um, they do their business. What we have is the females then lay these egg masses. And they tend to lay the egg masses on bark and especially in the fissures of bark, but they will lay them over a number of uh, other items as well. Not always at the bottom of the trees, but you often see them on the main part of the tree. 
and even down by the stump, uh, the stump area. Next. So gypsy moth damage is predominantly from the defoliation, basically eating the leaves. Uh, they prefer oak in our area, red oak is most abundant, uh, but they prefer oak, but they will uh, gladly eat a number of other trees, uh, aspen, uh, even maple, and a number of other uh, tarn hardwood trees. And even white pine, uh, and I've seen that out in Dillon this year in Carling Township, where they were uh, congregated on smaller white pine trees. Now a tree can tolerate some defoliation if the tree is healthy, but multiple years of defoliation um, or drought or other stresses can lead to tree mortality. And that has been seen in the past where uh, we've lost a, a lot of trees to defoliation by gypsy moth. And certainly when they're on white pine, white pine is less, um, less tolerant of defoliation. Now, some of the hardwood trees like, like oak, uh, after they become defoliated, they may put out a second flush of leaves. Um, however, sometimes this can be more harmful than beneficial because they're using a lot of the resources up, a lot of their food stores up, and they don't have a lot of time to make up for that in photosynthesis and capturing food for the coming year. So that can actually put an additional stress on the tree. Next. So the gypsy moth defoliation certainly can be uh, a stressor to the tree, but it also causes some uh, changes in habitats. Uh, there's a loss of shade when, when trees lose all their leaves in summer, a uh, number of species and uh, bird species and bird nests and what have you. Um, they're used to being there because of the shade um, and especially for the later nesters. Uh, by the time law defoliation happens, some, some species will already have uh, pretty much fledged their, fledged their young. But it's certainly a tremendous stage to the habitat. One caterpillar through its life can eat up to one square meter of foliage. There's also a nuisance factor. Um, perhaps nature doesn't mind so much about it, but uh, this uh, photo is the top of, a, top of a vehicle that was parked down on Rankin Lake Road uh, this year. And um, basically it's uh, raining gypsy moth feces. So it's, and you can actually, when you're out in the forest, uh, you can actually hear it's almost like it's raining on the ground and it's not rain. Uh, moss may be a, uh, a nuisance for some people, but again, it's, it's just the, the males that fly and they're not doing any uh, direct damage. Next. Now population cycles uh, for gypsy moth ended up not being what it was thought they were going to be. It started really back in the uh, mid 1980s over in Tweed. The Tweed area was the first main outbreaks where Ontario started dealing with gypsy moth. Um, it came into Muskoka Perry Sound around 1990-91 and those years were very high population levels. It was expected that that trend would continue every five to seven years but it simply hasn't except for a little blip back in the early 2000s, um, they've really been at low levels um, over the last basically uh, almost 30 years now. However, some indication in the last two years of increase in gypsy moth, 2020 is proving to be a major increase. And so the question is, what can the future hold for 2021? Is it going to be a much more significant outbreak? Next. So this is just a uh, two ma maps um, from some defoliation uh, surveys that Ministry of Natural Resources has done. In 2018, you can see very little uh, moderate to severe defoliation, except for down in the, uh, basically the Niagara, Niagara to Toronto area. And in 2019, that has expanded. If you look up in the Perry Sound area, more to the central top of the screen, you can start seeing a couple little red spots. And I expect fully uh, when this map is produced for 2020 that there'll be an explosion of red and yellow on the screen and, and certainly in parts of uh, the Perry Sound Muskoka area. Next. So 
what causes these populations to go up and down? We're never really certain exactly why the populations tend to explode on a variety of insect species. Um, but there's lots of, uh, even though gypsy moth is an exotic species, uh, there are a number of predators, bacteria, and viruses that help keep populations in check and, act and then contribute to uh, the collapse of these outbreaks. Um, the photo on the right is, is a uh, photo of dead caterpillars. They're kind of sort of deflated, uh, and that's showing signs of viral infections. I took that photo on a tree in my yard in Carling Township uh, just about a week and a half ago. Next. So there are some control measures uh, uh, people or municipalities, whatever, may do. And there is a spray. Um, and the common spray is Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT as it's commonly called, sometimes BTK. It is not a chemical spray, but instead of spray of naturally occurring bacteria, it only affects the Lepidopter species, moths uh, that moths uh, belong to. Uh, it's been used for many years for forest, things like forest 10 caterpillar budworm. Uh, it must be sprayed in the early instars. What that means is the first stages of caterpillar development. And that's at a time in late May and early June where we're really not seeing the effects of that defoliation yet because they're very small, they're feeding, but they're not feeding much because of their small size. The aerial, there was an actual aerial spraying done in uh, late May of this year in Etobicoke, basically between Highway 427 and I think Kipling Avenue, I think it was. Um, so they have sprayed in urban areas. Uh, even, even in Vancouver has sprayed in the past uh, for this species. Um, Back in the early 1990s, in this area, in the Muskoka Perry Sound area, a number of cottagers have chose to employ directly with uh, aerial spray companies to treat around their cottages. However, it should be kept in mind that a lot of these measures aren't necessarily controlling the population, it's protecting the trees to, to uh, protect them from defoliation. Next. There are some, um, other homeowner type control measures that individuals may wish to investigate, especially on those trees in the front yard, something that probably not very practical in, in a forest setting or a woodlot setting, but certainly something that you might do on a, on a front yard. And that is things like uh, wrapping burlap around the tree, uh, letting it fold down. What happens is the uh, caterpillars, they don't like the hot sun. So during the heat of the day, they tend to come down and they hide in the fissures, the crevices of the rough bark, uh, underside of branches to get out of that sun. So if providing a really nice shady place, uh, they often congregate there. And somebody that comes around and checks them, you know, a couple of times a day or once a day and scrapes them off, maybe into a pail of soapy water, whatever, can reduce the population that way on some individual trees. Some people have used a sticky material like a sticky tape material and when those caterpillars have come down, escaped the hot sun and they got uh, stuck on this sticky material. However, in the past, I have heard of people putting things like tar, really sticky stuff, right directly on the bark of trees, which has caused a lot more damage than good. So make sure if somebody does that, it's, it's still protecting the tree and nothing, uh, nothing going on it that's going to damage it. Next. One thing that's very common people can do, and you have a little bit more time to do this, is to go around and scrape egg masses. So you see those, those egg masses are, as I said before, on the tree, often around the base of the tree, on lawn furniture, on the siding of that wooden cottage, uh, on the wood pile, lots of places like that. But there's a fair amount of time because when they're laid, they're not gonna hatch until next spring. So it could be a fun, a fun activity for kids at the cottage or somebody at the house to go around and, and have a uh, egg mass hunt. And basically you're scraping them off and you want to get rid of the eggs. Again, hot soapy water is, is, uh, is, is one method. Um, there's probably other ways we can dispose of them, but basically getting them off the trees. Each of those egg masses could be a hundred to a thousand caterpillars that are not 
then go into basically hatch next spring and start feeding. Uh, people do uh, forest health specialists, if they want to do surveys on, on what populations are going to be in the next year, tend to do uh, forecasting by doing egg mass surveys. And also pheromone traps basically mimics that female moth and see what they capture. Uh, and you can find uh, some people sell pheromone traps uh, and some people buy them up as a control method, but they really are for monitoring. Uh, it's unlikely they're gonna be effective of controlling populations. Next. So I'm gonna move out of gypsy moth and another uh, really devastating pest of our forest. Uh, another exotic uh, pest that is causing so much damage in the last 10 years has been beech bark disease. And beech bark disease, it's caused by two, not just one, but needs two non-native causal agents. One is a little insect called beech scale. And another one is a pathogen, uh, Neonectria vaginata. So what you need to have beech bark disease on the left hand side of the screen, that is an American beech. It is not a birch. I've had many people say birch bark disease. It is not birch bark disease. It is beech bark disease. So it will not attack other species, which thank heavens for that. Um, then you have the insects. It's a very close up, those little translucent yellow and coated with like a white waxy substance is the insect. You add some pathogen spores in there and you can get an infection that creates beech bark disease. And the photo on the right is a fruiting body that generally comes out in the fall. Next. So beech bark disease, it's been around North America for a long time. Uh, the scale insects were introduced from Europe, identified back in the late 1800s in, in Nova Scotia. By the 1930s, people were starting to see beech die from beech bark disease in the Maritimes and, and in Maine. It was a long time. It wasn't identified uh, in Quebec until 1965, and in the first tree mortality north of Toronto was recorded in 1981. Still, it took almost another 30 years for it to be confirmed in the Muskoka area, and then shortly thereafter in the Perry Sound. We first uh, made the discovery over in the Baysville, Van Coonet area east of Bracebridge. It has since expanded a wide band from east of Dorset to Perry Sound and has been expanding northward. The first significant beach scale, uh, really large buildups were within or beside adjacent to Kilbear and Arrowhead Provincial Parks. And is that a coincidence or is it because this uh, insect was able to, at some stage, uh, come up on firewood and people moving firewood. Uh, it's, we've also seen in some areas more densely on some heavily cottaged roads. Again, there's that tree dying somewhere in Southern Ontario and somebody brought the firewood up. They don't need it in the, the city perhaps, but bring them up to the cottage. That is a very poss large possibility. The truth is it's here now and it's been here for 10 years and it is spreading. Next. So basically you have this insect. It has a little uh, stylus. It, it pokes a, a tiny little hole into the bark and the outer cells of the bark. It changes the, uh, the, the physiology of those cells and makes them receptive for the, uh, the pathogen to, to enter and, uh, and take over the cell and cause death to the cell. There's a report of lag times between when you first start seeing those insects on the trees and to where you start seeing the fungus infection, those red fruiting bodies. Two to 10 years. Uh, on the Canadian Shield, what we're finding, it's closer to two years. It's happening pretty fast. Next. Just a few identification slides here. Uh, so that's a, a beech tree, and you notice all that white streaked on the, the tree, that is the scale. That is the, those are the insects. At, in early stages, there's only a few little flakes, almost like dandruff, you have to look really closely. But once it's established, it's, it's very apparent. Next. Here's a tree with, that's just covered in the fruiting bodies. So it's just all around. Um, they're often pear-shaped. 
uh, or lemon shaped, uh, the fruiting bodies come up, but then they coalesce and it's almost completely around this tree. There's a lot on this tree. Next. Just a cross section. Uh, this tree is still healthy uh, in terms that you could see the dark uh, areas where the cells have been killed. In, it's still in the outer bark of the tree. It hasn't reached the cambium layer, the, the, where the uh, basically where the bark and the inside, the wood of the tree meet. Uh, once that happens, though, and it's around enough of it, is when you start seeing the tree health suffers. Um, the crown start thinning, branches start dying, and eventually the tree dies. Next. We go through three stages of spread of beech bark disease. The first one is called the advancing front, and it's characterized by basically the, the rival and colonization trees by just the scale. Some of our forest in this region is still in the stage. Some of our forest, I was out yesterday in the forest in the South River area and the Kearney area. I have some beech bark disease monitoring plots, and there's no sign of it yet. Um, so some of it, we're still kind of going into that stage. Next. And then we hit the killing front, and it's characterized by the rapid buildup of scale infestation. You can see that all the way up this tree, uh, just how much scale is there. Next. And abundant infection, abundant neonectary infection and canker development, and see all these fruiting bodies. You can see all those lemon or pear-shaped uh, fruiting bodies on this tree. Next. And then we start seeing heavy levels of tree mortality. And there seems to be a fairly short time frame from the advancing front to the killing front in the Muskoka and Perry Sound areas. And, I, and they're seeing the same thing in many places in Quebec, in more southern parts of the province. Uh, it doesn't seem to be as fast and some trees seem to be able to recover. Uh, but here maybe our shallow soils or lower pH levels of some of our soils. Uh, Less growing seasons, not certain, but it seems to ha be happening um, disturbingly quickly. So we're well into this stage in our recent from Dors uh, Dorset, Frost Center, Baysville, Kilbear Park, Perry Sound. I have plots up in the uh, north of Point of Barrel, and uh, it's, it's there as well. So it has done a lot of spreading over the last 10 years and a lot of mortality already happening. Next. One thing to note that Lots of times one insect or one disease or one stressor does not necessarily kill a tree, but it can weaken the tree. And often you have other fungus and other factors, pathogens that can come in and kill your tree. And sometimes you'll see uh, fungal bodies uh, or cankers on trees that may came in after the tree actually was already dead. Some, some pathogens specialize in that after trees have already died. Next. The aftermath zone is characterized by lower scale populations. Not too many trees left. Uh, the ones that are, some of them may be resistant or tolerant. Um, the trees that are left, many of them may be very defective. I don't think we're there yet, although I think we're getting close in some pockets in our forest. Next. Some folks ask, you know, they hear about some resistance or tolerance, and there's some thought and some studies done in, in some place in the northeastern U.S. have been dealing with it for a long time. I uh, believe that there may be as much as one to four percent of beech trees that exhibit some sort of resistance to the scale insect. If you don't have the scale insect, you don't have the disease. Problem is we can't identify them. There's no really way to know until we see which trees died or which trees are still healthy after after all those fronts have moved in, the killing front has gone through to see are some of these maybe resistant or tolerant or were they just lucky? Next. One thing that's very unique about beech bark disease is most disease in insects, we worry about losing the species. We worry about the individual trees and they're being killed and therefore the population of the, of the tree being wiped out. Um, it's almost the ex opposite. Uh, 
when beech bark disease starts killing a forest and there's regeneration, it tends to explode. The beech regeneration is very vigorous and it creates very heavy shade. There can be a 50% reduction in plant species diversity, uh, ferns, other herbaceous plants, and of course trees. And it just completely overshadows and overshades species like maple and birch. So there's really nothing else to take its place. It just creates, we call them beech jungles. When these trees die, the mature trees die, we're having like actual not inches of growth per year, but feet per growth per year. Sorry, I should do the metric equivalent, but uh, up to a meter plus growth a year. The problem is these individuals have really no future. Next. The picture on the left shows, it's from the US. Uh, it shows a uh, well after the killing fronts have gone through and the young trees have, have come up and they become cankered, uh, short-lived, uh, low mass yielding. They don't create many beech nuts. Uh, they have very little or next to no commercial value. In the meantime, they're overshading the other forest trees that have a chance to form nice mature canopies. Um, what Westman has been doing on the Crown Forest in some places we've identified where these beech jungles are and we're taking steps to try to reduce the amount of young beech that's coming in and creating these jungles to give other species a chance at, at forming another uh, a, a mature canopy down the road. By all means, we're not getting rid of all of them. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't, but we're trying to reduce that population to get other, to benefit other plants, uh, not just trees, but other plants as well. Uh, next. One thing homeowners and public should be aware of that trees attacked by beech bark disease represent a particular danger. Uh, certainly dead and dying trees, we all know if there's a big dead tree, it represents a danger of uh, branches falling. Beech bark disease, the tree may snap a large branch or even snap right in half, big mature trees when the tree is still alive and hasn't shown that much indication that it's been affected. So it's actually a term beech snap and in Kilbert Provincial Park, not that many years ago, there was a near miss where a family was camping, a family group was camping. The day after they left, a big branch came down and completely destroyed two metal-based picnic tables. And that prompted the park to do a huge beach salvage. Uh, several, several truckloads of beach were harvested around their trails, campgrounds, parking lots, because they are a danger. So that's also dangers around people's cottage, drives, soy paths, docks, what have you. And the important thing is to consider removing it before the trees dies because once it dies, it becomes a really dangerous thing to take down. And it's not a predictable thing where, okay, I'll leave this tree until it's completely dead, then I'll remove it. Uh, you may wanna be looking at that uh, ahead of time. Next. Protecting your own trees, there's really no, there's really no good options. Uh, some people have tried insecticidal soap for scale insects or a dormant oil on the scale insects, and certainly that may work if you get enough of the scale. But the scale can be way up the tree where it becomes really impractical to treat. People have tried blasting the scale insects off with the power with the power washer. All things that people, you know, perhaps can and should try. Just the effectiveness is don't expect a lot of uh, a lot of positive results, but some people may want to, may want to try something rather than nothing. Um, in a woodlot, uh, in a grove of forest, or what have you around your place, you may want to prevent some root sprouts from becoming too vigorous, and perhaps remove some of them to give uh, more light, more opportunity for whether it's oak or maple or birch or pine or something else to take the place. Um, whether you remove beech trees now or later, uh, it, it depends on your objectives and your feasibility. If somebody perhaps you know own ten acre a ten acre woodlot uh, and and regularly cut a uh, cut a couple trees down every year, some firewood, you'd have more ability to manage that as opposed to bringing somebody in. They're going to have to take them all or not at one time. Next. So last slide in here, and that's just to remind us that we're, we're losing all these beech trees. We're losing a tremendous resource in this part of Ontario. It's, uh, we always think of acorns and all the uh, 
cartoons and everything with squirrels and Chippendale and everything is about the acorns. The truth is for compared to red oak acorns, uh, beech nuts have a higher fat and higher protein content um, and more similar to even corn. And in many areas, like what we have through much of our forest, is beech is a lot more numerous. So it is a critical uh, supply of a hard mast, i.e. the beech nuts, for a number of species from deer, uh, game birds like grouse, many songbirds, uh, even pine marten. And of course, that starts affecting the whole food cycle as well. And probably no other species will, will be affected as much as, as black bears. Next. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, my coworker, uh, Forrester Margaret Scott. Or are we do going to do questions first? Yeah, I think we're going to stop to do questions now. Yeah, we have uh, about five questions to answer and I thought we could do it the rapid fire style. Um, First question from Ian. I have noticed the second flush of oak leaves are red in color and poorly formed. Any ideas what's going on there? Not specifically other than you're having a tree that's been under a lot of stress. The trees store their, you know, their food resources and the roots each year, of course. Uh, they use a tremendous amount of that in putting out that first flush of leaves in the year. The weakest the tree ever is really is in the spring in the weeks following uh, leaf out because it's depleted many of its resources. Mm -hmm. So when it hasn't had much time to really replace these resources and has to put a second flush on, often you find um, the tree exhibiting growth that's, that's not normal. But the actual physiological or chemical uh, processes that happen for it to be read, uh, I, I couldn't comment on. Yeah, there's a few specific questions. I will ask them, but it's very, it is tricky to know for sure without seeing a picture of, of certain trees, what the problem is. Um, a comment more than a question, just wanna ask, well, point out about um, the BTK use and what impacts might it have on other moth, butterfly, insect species, um, overall ecosystem impacts. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, Barry. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not promoting the use of it. I'm just identifying that uh, it is, it has been used for many years and it certainly can affect other, uh, other Lepidoptera uh, species in the Lepidoptera. Um, there tends to be when they're sprayed and, and I haven't been part of this at all. So I know there's, there's concerns about, uh, uh, timing and uh, things, other considerations, um, but certainly, yeah, it has the impact to uh, affect other Lepidoptera species. A uh, question about balsam fir trees on dying on a property near Humphrey. Um, is this a widespread phenomenon? And uh, asking what are the possible agents? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is not a, uh, a beech bark disease or a gypsy moth situation. Um, I can tell you that there has been some, there's a phenomenon that people are seeing over in Renfrew County. I'm not sure if that's the situation or not. I'm not sure if it's a viral situation, um, but I was over to Ottawa a few weeks ago and it was, it was quite prevalent over there. Uh, but I, I can't say for sure what's, what's happening there. Um, and I, you might have the same answer for this one. Uh, do you know what is wrong with the forest on Bayview Drive in Carling at Beacon Point? Something is wrong on both sides of the road. Um, again, very specific though. Very specific. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what trees we're talking about, but I, I can tell you that uh, living in Carling and not too far away from there, um, over the last few years, about three years ago, I saw a lot of, there's a lot of elm along um, Carling Bay and Bayview Drive, and I'm pretty certain it's Dutch elm disease. Uh, whether those are the trees we're talking about, I don't know, but I know Dutch elm disease has taken some trees out, okay. which is a, it's a whole different subject. 
Uh, we have some questions on um, best management regarding beach bark disease for homeowners. So um, what can homeowners do to help preserve beach nuts? Are they able to plant them on their properties? And should homeowners be cutting down um, the regeneration to encourage other saplings and ground cover um, instead of the, the regen? So what we've been doing is we've been taking out a lot of the mature beach because in, when we go into stands for management, um, the beach uh, roots are very sensitive and they put up a lot of, uh, a lot of beach regeneration and the beach bark disease just exacerbates the problem. So the, what the experts are telling us and, and folks from the States and who've also done research in Ontario is actually strictly for some objectives is to get rid of most or all of your overstory beach. We still retain some if it's healthy. Uh, even if we don't expect to live too long because we feel, still feel the importance of that mass trees, even if it's around for only five or 10 years. But if there's any sign of disease, it's likely going to perish. So we're getting rid of it now. So the thing is with, uh, when I mentioned, they tend to sprout a lot. When they sprout, they are the same tree. They're a clone of the tree that was just affected. So if that was a, a tree that was susceptible to attack, then all the offspring from that is going to be susceptible to attack as well. So again, it depends on what resources you want to apply and what your objectives are. Uh, you're going to cut down one tree at a time uh, before you're going to cut them, take a uh, more proactive uh, and cut them, even though they're not showing any signs to get other species encouraged, or you want to leave them there until they absolutely have to get rid of them is, is kind of in a personal objective uh, uh, decision to make about uh, planting there's only a need to plant beech nuts if you know that they're coming from a, a resistant tolerant tree they're coming from the trees that are dying anyways when you plant that tree it's it's likely going to be not resistant it's probably going to have the same uh same fate as the trees that are dying now okay uh, the last question, uh, just back to the gypsy moths, is um, basically, I, I think it was to one of your maps early on about the distribution in Ontario. Uh, there were some gaps in the map, and we're just wondering if, if there's places in Ontario where there aren't gypsy moths, are they traveling on people's vehicles? Um, are there things like that? Moving firewood um, is usually a culprit too. Is that the case for gypsy moths? I mean, nobody can say for sure, but certainly when you bring things up from one area to another and firewood is the, is the key example and a message we've been trying to put out for many years is don't move firewood. And certainly that's possible. Uh, if, a, if a moth laid its eggs on a vehicle, and they do, and it comes up around the time that they're uh, hatching, uh, it's possible. Having said that, the eggs, are, are they going to overwinter and drive around all winter long or from the 1st of August to next May and still be viable? I, I don't know if that's the case, but certainly on campers and tents and things like that, uh, that I'm in the backyard, certainly that's a possibility. But firewood's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest culprit. All right. Awesome. Just looking at the time, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Margaret now. Perfect. Thanks, Delena. Uh, so like Barry mentioned, I'm Margaret Scott. I'm a forester and I've worked with Westwind uh, since 2017. Uh, I should note that the pictures of Barry and I seem to suggest that foresters just lean against trees, but I promise we do do more than that. Uh, so since we have talked about gypsy moth, I wanted to talk about another defoliator that has gotten some attention in the last few years, forest tent caterpillar. Unlike gypsy moth, forest tent caterpillar is actually native to North America. Uh, it attacks primarily trembling aspen, oak, ash, maple, and white birch. And it has regular outbreaks in Ontario about every 10 to 12 years. So the graph on the left here shows these large outbreaks outbreaks by hectares of moderate to severe defoliation. Um, and as you can see, we've had pretty regular outbreaks since the 1950s when this graph started. Um, and outbreaks typically last from three to six years in an area. So how do you identify forest tent caterpillar? 
Well, the mature forest tent caterpillars are about five centimeters long. They are hairy, dark brown, and have a blue stripe along each side of their body. And you can see in the picture here that they have these neat white keyhole shaped spots that run along the center of their back. So that's a great way to identify them. Uh, in terms of impacts, forest tent caterpillars feed on the leaves of hardwood trees and in the early part of the season they eat leaves near the top of the tree and then they move toward the inner and lower leaves as the season progresses. So trees can actually withstand infestations fairly well. Um, however, longer infestations can result in less growth and the potential death of branches and trees can eventually uh, actually die, uh, but that's particularly if they're already suffering from another form of stress, such as drought or another insect. So again, we have a range map here that shows moderate to severe defoliation. Um, and starting in 2017, you can see a fair amount has been caused by forest head caterpillar. So if you look to the left, you can see Georgian Bay and the Perry Sound region there. Uh, this continued into 2018, uh, but then by last year, the population had largely collapsed and areas of defoliation were far fewer and were more isolated. So 2019 appeared to be the end of the local outbreak and most of the defoliation we are seeing this year is likely caused by gypsy moth. Uh, as was shown by the outbreak graph on the first slide, we can though expect to see future outbreaks of forest tent caterpillar in Ontario. So in terms of control, because forest tent caterpillar is native, it does have natural control mechanisms. So after a year or two of the outbreak, parasites and diseases be begin to control the infestation. Um, a virus kills many of the young caterpillars and can affect the dispersal and reproductive ability of the female moss. And then there's also parasites such as flies and wasps, which also help to control these infestations. Um, so much so that later in an outbreak, up to 80% of large larvae can be attacked by other insects. Uh, sorry, I apologize, we just have a train going by here. Um, I'll just wait one second. Sorry. Um, so, despite these natural controls, if you would like to do something yourself, you can check trees in the late winter and early spring for egg bands, and you can remove these yourself. Uh, however, this doesn't guarantee that that egg will not get infested, as caterpillars can infest trees after the egg bands have been removed. Uh, you can also remove caterpillars that are feeding on a tree. Uh, you can simply do this by hand and destroy them, or you can spray a tree with water. Finally, similar to gypsy moth, like Barry was saying, the caterpillar, such as BT, uh, but as always, it's super important to consult a professional the minute you're dealing with pesticides. So most times forest tent caterpillar will naturally control itself, but those are just options if you wanna do something on specific trees or in your area. So the next pest I wanted to talk about is emerald ash borer, or EAB as it is often called. It's an invasive beetle which has been found to attack most species of ash. Uh, it's native to East Asia, including areas in China and the Russian Far East, and it was first detected in Windsor in 2002, but has since been found in southern Ontario, Quebec, Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie. And more recently, EAB was actually found near Gravenhurst and Bracebridge in 2018, uh, and Kilbear Provincial Park in 2019, and the MNRF has also confirmed it in Port Severn, Bala, Perry Sound, and Perry Island. Uh, it is important to note that these have just identified that it is here and doesn't necessarily say how widespread or how bad the infestation is yet. It's still relatively recent. Uh, and in our forest, less than about 1% of our trees are ash. Um, we have a white ash in some stands and then black ash in some of our wetter sites. So first I wanted to talk about identifying ash trees. On mature trees, bark is tight and displays these patterns of diamond-shaped ridges. And on young trees, bark is actually relatively smooth. Uh, a great identifier is actually the leaves, which contain five to 11 leaflets. And those leaflets are positioned 
opposite to each other with one at the top. So if you look at the right picture, you can see that they kind of each have a pair directly across from the leaf, and then there's a single leaf at the top. So those are arranged in 5 to 11. Uh, the branches and buds also show this opposite, um, this opposite characteristic where they're directly across from each other rather than being staggered. So when you see a branch or a bud coming off a main branch, you'll see them, you'll see it has a pair directly across from it. If there's some branches missing, it may appear that not every branch is opposite, but overall they do have opposite branching. So now that we've identified the ash tree, how do you identify the emerald ash borer itself? So the adults have elongated bodies that are metallic green and about one to 1.5 centimeters long. They have black eyes and a flat head. You can see them on the left there. And then on the right, you can see a larva, which is creamy white with 10 bell-shaped abdominal, abdominal segments, sorry. And when fully mature, they're about three centimeters long. Um, and the larva goes through four of those instar growth stages, like Barry was talking about earlier. So what's the life cycle of the emerald ash borer? So the metallic green adults come out in June and July and then lay their eggs on the bark of ash trees. After the egg hatches, the larvae burrow into the inner bark and cambial layer and it feeds on the tissue, creating these feeding galleries or tunnels that you'll see. The larva then excavates a tiny chamber that'll stay inside during the winter. And finally, it pupates or develops into an adult in April and May before the cycle starts again. Interestingly enough, in southwestern Ontario, the cycle is complete in one year. However, further north, about 30% of the population actually takes two years to complete this life cycle. So what are some of the impacts that you would see on a tree and what should you look for? The galleries that the borer create girdle the tree by cutting off the flow of water and nutrients. So this may result in crown dieback. So that's the leaves around the top of the tree um, all around. You might see some dieback and the canopy actually dies from the top down. So the leaves may also turn yellow or wilt and the galleries that the larvae have created may cause bark cracks that are seven to 10 centimeters long. They're more obvious in young trees, which do not have those splits due to growth and tend to be a bit smoother. And then because woodpeckers feed on the larvae, you can also look for increased woodpecker damage. Another thing that you can see in the top photo there is the adult borers emerge from distinctly D-shaped holes. They're about 3.5 to 4 centimeters across. So you'll see that they have a flat edge and then kind of that curve of the D um, just in the bark there. Uh, so finally, if you notice signs of infestation, remove some, you can remove some of the bark of the tree and you will see S-shaped galleries that the larvae have created, just like the bottom photo there. Um, after infestation, large trees can die in as little as three to four years, um, so it can be very devastating. Because of this, it's important to try to detect emerald ash borer early. And this is actually what Muskoka Conservancy and their partners started in 2015 in this area. They set up green prism traps in ash tree canopies and high traffic areas of Muskoka. The traps are coated with a glue-like substance to trap insects, and it also contains lures to bait the emerald ash borer. In 2018, they found an emerald ash borer at a site near Bracebridge, and they also found one at a site near Gravenhurst. And then in 25 2019, they found boar at two sites, both near Gravenhurst, um, just because they didn't see or find another emerald ash borer near that Bracebridge site in 2019. It does not mean it's not there. They just didn't necessarily trap any. Um, and I just wanted to also mention that MNRF has confirmed the presence of EAB near Perry Sound Bala and Port Severn, and we've also seen it at Kilbear. So it's definitely in this region now. So once there is an established emerald ash borer infestation, there are really only two main options for urban trees. So an insecticide treatment or cutting down the tree. So triazine is the main insecticide being used to control emerald ash borer. It's injected under a tree's bark, like you can see this professional doing in the photo here, and moves upward with the flow of water and nutrients. So it's applied between May and August, 
And since it is a pesticide, again, it needs to be applied by a licensed professional. So triazine can be effective at controlling emerald ash borer for up to two years. However, some areas are suggesting that at the peak of infection, at, sorry, the peak of infestation, you wanna be applying it annually. Um, so although this is a great option, it's important to consider what trees are ideal for this treatment. First of all, it's important that they're in an area with emerald ash borer, or why are you doing it? Uh, the tree should have good overall health and be structurally sound to ensure that it is worth treating. Triazine is usually applied to trees which might be difficult or expensive to remove or replace, or have a significant value to you or a group of people. It costs about five to 650 per centimeter of diameter of a tree. So it can get quite costly depending on the size of the tree and how many times you'll have to treat it. Uh, so for instance, if you have a 30 centimeter diameter tree and we're going with that $5 cost, it's gonna be $150 every time you treat it. And remember, you're gonna have to treat it more than once. So another option is to remove trees. And this is especially important if a tree is declining or dying as a result of emerald ash borer and poses a risk to people or property. So if you are concerned about a tree, it is best to consult a forestry professional such as an arborist uh, who can help you kind of make decisions and see how that tree is doing. And depending on where you live, some municipalities may have tree cutting bylaws or permits that are required. So it's best to check on that before you cut down a tree. Uh, once the tree is cut, it's also important that the wood is not moved out of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency regulated area, which we are in. But this area is actually quite large, uh, so it's even best practice to slow the spread further by avoid moving the wood very far into new locations. So speaking of removing trees, I just wanted to highlight that Kilbear Provincial Park had to remove a significant number of trees over the past year due to the outbreak that they found in 2019. The two main clusters were campgrounds that were about three kilometers apart. They estimate that they cut around 7,000 trees, um, and those are ones that could fall on a road or a campsite. So although many were not necessarily hazardous at this stage because it's an early infestation, it was decided to cut them down preemptively for safety. So of course, this was all made more difficult with COVID and contributed to Kilbear being one of the last parks to open this year. And this is actually a photo I took at Kilbear in 2019 um, of an emerald ash borer and those galleries that I was talking about earlier. So when we are talking about larger areas and woodlots, there are a few more management options. So although it might seem like you should, you do not need to remove all ash trees. Instead, it's important to encourage diversity in the woodlot, in the woodlot by promoting other species and potentially reducing the ash component. So if you are thinning your woodlot, focus on removing poor quality stems of all species aside from those kept for wildlife. And depending on your goal for your woodlot, woodlot, ash trees will retain timber value for a time after initial attack around three to five years. So a forestry can, professional can help you make some of those decisions um, and will take into account long-term goals and sustainability. Um, and again, it's important if you do take down ash to not move it outside the regulated area. So now that we've talked about some of the forest pests in our kind of local area, I wanted to focus on two that may be coming here in the future. The first is hemlock woolly adalgid. It's a tiny aphid-like insect that feeds on and kills hemlock trees. It attaches to the branch and extracts nutrients and sap at the base of the needles. If there are enough insects, trees can be defoliated and eventually die. So the eastern hemlock, which is the common hemlock that we see around this area, is the only native host in eastern Canada. And you can see the white woolly masses in that photo there. Um, all along the base. So hemlock woolly adalgis is an invasive species from Japan. It's first discovered in North America in Virginia in the 1950s and then it was detected in Ontario for the first time in 2012 in Etobicoke and then in 2013-2014 near Niagara Falls. These populations were all eradicated. However, in 2019, as part of a detection survey, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency confirmed again that hemlock woolly adalgid was found near Niagara Falls and near Waynefleet, Ontario. So official control measures were applied to prevent the spread into non-infested areas, but it has been a confirmed once again in Ontario. So on this map, you can see that hemlock woolly adalgid has been detected in many counties along the Canada-US border near Niagara Falls. 
uh, and just also to note, in 2017, hemochloid algid was also detected in southwestern Nova Scotia, which you can see on the map as well. So what are the pathways of spread? Once the young crawling insects begin feeding on hemlock, they actually don't move. However, when birds, deer, and other wildlife can carry them to other trees and areas. Of course, they can also be spread even further by nursery stock or wood products such as saw logs or firewood. Um, and hemlock woolly adalgid usually spreads the most near lakes and streams, near bird feeders, in high traffic areas of parks, or near planted nursery stock, just based on how it spreads. So, in terms of identifying hemlock woolly adalgid, uh, the best thing to do is to examine the base of the needles on the underside of the branches. Uh, this is actually a picture of me uh, near Rochester, New York, looking at a hemlock tree that was infested with hemlock woolly adalgid. It was pretty shocking just how infested these trees were. Uh, you can see white woolly ova sacs or egg sacs. Um, that's the easiest way to see it, and they're most obvious from March to May. The tree may also exhibit signs like premature dieback in the buds, twigs, or branches, and it can also lose some of its needles. So the crown may also be thinner or be a grayish green color, and there may also be discoloration of the needles, so they may be yellow or orange. And eventually with enough infestations, tree may, trees may die in as little as four years. So, although it's not here yet, I wanted to quickly discuss a few of the treatment options. So there are topical treatments such as mineral oils and soaps that suffocate the insects, but it's quite difficult to apply to the top of trees to have a complete application, so it's not as effective. Systematic insecticides that are applied and then travel throughout the hemlock tree have been found to be an effective tool, but of course this isn't necessarily practical. Um, for all trees, particularly in woodlots or forests where there may be just too many hemlock to treat. So, another tool that has been tested is the release of predators. In the United States, seven species have been released since 1993. And the main focus has been on predatory silverflies, which feed on eggs, and then beetles, which feed on the insect. Uh, there's still obstacles to overcome for both species, but in this photo, near Rochester, New York, researchers were releasing a predatory species onto a hemlock tree to study its impacts. So when hemlock woolly adalgid does get closer, what can we do? We want to make sure that we are monitoring hemlock stands so we know when it gets here. Promote the, healthy, the health of hemlock trees to improve resilience. Uh, because birds can spread the adalgid, don't hang feeders near hemlocks. Nursery stock can also be a cause of spread, so buy local trees and always inspect them first. Finally, similar to other pests, buy local firewood and consult a forestry professional for more information. And if you do see hemlock woolly adalgid, report to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Now remember right now, it's still much further south. Uh, so a lot of these tips we don't really need to be following now, but are good to keep in mind for the future. So finally, the last forest health concern that I wanted to talk about is oak wilt disease. It's a vascular disease caused by a fungus called Brittziella phagocerium that affects oak trees. It restricts the flow of water and nutrients through the tree, and it's actually capable of killing oak trees in a single season. Uh, species of red oak are more often infected, and they actually die more quickly than white oaks. And although it occurs in many states, including Michigan, it has not yet been detected in Canada, but it has been detected on Bell Island, which is only about 600 meters from the shores of Windsor. So it's definitely a concern for Southern Ontario right now. So how do you identify oak wilt disease? Some signs include discoloration of leaves, which start on the outside of the leaf and then work its way in. You can see that on the left-hand photo. The wilting and discoloration also starts at the top of the crown and progresses downwards. There may also be some premature leaf fall. And another sign of this disease is the fungal mats just under the bark, and they, admit a, they emit a fruity smell that some actually describe as being like juicy fruit. Um, so you can see a, an example of one of these fungal mats on the right. These mats put outward pressure on the bark and cause bark cracks in the trunk and large branches. What's interesting about oak wilt disease is that it's primarily spread from diseased healthy trees through the roots, so the connections between roots, um, and more minorly it can be spread by oak bark beetles and sap beetles. So like hemlock woolly adalgid, oak wilt disease is not close to this area yet. 
but when it is, there unfortunately is no cure for oak wilt disease, and still, instead, treatment mainly focuses on reducing the spread of infection. So this includes, like many others, not moving firewood, not pruning oak trees from April to July, when there's most likely to be spores spread by insects, removing diseased trees, and then where diseased and healthy trees are near each other, we wanna disrupt that root connection since the, that's the main way it's spread. So you really have to separate those roots. So I also just wanted to mention that these pests and diseases are not acting on these trees independently. There's other factors that can lead to a tree being stressed. Weather, such as drought, flooding, the timing of frost, can all lead to a tree being stressed. This can increase a tree's vulnerability to a disease or pest, or it can also combine the combination of weather pattern stressors and the infection can lead to further injury or mortality. So for instance, as Barry was kind of talking about earlier, some of the insects that defoliate trees do not always kill the tree, but if a tree is already stressed due to drought or something like that, it may be more likely to die. So just in conclusion, to kind of bring everything together and end on something we can actually do to affect change, I want to reiterate what has been said about almost every forest health concern we discussed. Please do not move firewood. Always buy local and burn local and encourage people around you to do the same. Firewood can really help spread a lot of these issues to new areas. Because each of you are listening to this today, I imagine you have an interest in our trees and forests, and I just ask that we all do our part to help our forests stay healthy. So thank you very much for being a part of this webinar today, and we'll go on to our second question period. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Margaret. We do have a handful of questions. Um, I will just acknowledge the time. Uh, a few people might have to leave us, and thanks again for joining. But we've got some really good questions here. Um, Susan's asking, what treatment options do you recommend for pine sawfly? Uh, Barry, do you have a... You can come back to that one if you prefer. Sorry, Barry's just muted. Just one moment. No worries. Oh. There, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you, Barry. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, I was saying great things. <laughs> so um, there's a number of different sawfly species. They affect different, uh, different trees. So um, we've had introduced pine sawflies. I've, I've attacked white pine near fairly close to Georgian Bay for the most part in the past. Uh, Red-headed pine sawflies, there's a number of different sawfly species. Uh, I wouldn't say there's a lot of good control measures available. Um, there are chemical, true chemical pesticides that I'm not going to promote in any way, shape or form. I will mention though that I've heard people using that BT, uh, the bacterial one um, pesticide, uh, but it is not effective against sawflies because it is not part of the Lepidoptera family. Uh, therefore, it's, uh, it, it shouldn't be used. Um, some people just do manually picking them off. It's, uh, and, but it's very difficult, especially when you're dealing with some mature trees where the uh, sawfly are high in the tree. So sorry, don't have a lot of uh, really good solutions for them. Larry says, I have started seeing many more black and white spotted long antenna beetles in McKellar. I believe that these are Asian longhorn beetles or are they a naturally occurring beetle, um, a native species? Uh, is there anything we can do with them or should they be destroyed? So what you're almost certainly seeing there is the white spotted Sawyer beetle. And we've had this for many years since the Asian longhorn beetle back some years ago uh, became, uh, came to Ontario down in the uh, various areas outside of Toronto. 
Um, people became familiar with this. There's even signs actually I've seen uh, near Canada's Wonderland informing people of it. And there's, there's a lot of similarities, but every time somebody has submitted one of these to MNR or to ourselves, or we've seen them, it's a white pine, uh, it's a white uh, spotted soria beetle. Uh, they, they attack uh, dead, and disease, dying, really stressed pine. And I got a dead pine in my place, I can hear them chewing, um, like literally hear them chewing from several meters away. Um, so they're more of a uh, opportunistic insect that's uh, focusing on those trees. You're just seeing the uh, the beetle. I'm not saying it's a good beetle in terms of depends what your objectives are, but uh, the tree is already pretty stressed or dead or dying issues wrong if you have that in that. Often you'll see them in logs, in a pile of logs, or uh, you know you, you cut an old pine down or there's some uh, uh, pieces of wood uh, with the bark on them, uh, blocks of wood, they're probably in that as well. Yeah, I imagine they might be a favorite food of some of our woodpecker species. <laughs> Most definitely. Um, uh, question, can we purchase beech bark desistant, sorry, beech bark disease resistant saplings similar to the Dutch elm resistant saplings that are available in Guelph? Short answer is no on that. Um, I'm not sure when that is going to be made available. There's a lot of work. The U.S. is Northeast U.S. has been dealing with for decades with beech bark disease. They've been looking for resistance and tolerance and and breeding, and they're showing small amounts of success. But it's a. Uh, I think it. I think it's sometime in the future before we really see that. Uh, typically, planting hardwoods is a lot less susceptible, uh, a lot less successful than planting uh, conifer trees. So I'm not sure when that's going to happen, but not now. Okay. Um, in addition to planting, some uh, we'll send this out tomorrow, but the township or the archipelago, their environment webpage um, has a list of the forest pests that we've talked about as well as some of the others um, that weren't in the slideshow. So if you're interested, I will send it out tomorrow, but if you're really keen today, you can go to archipelago.ca slash environment and uh, read up on them there. So another question from uh, Val, what are the best or most important, sorry, most resilient <laughs> trees to plant? What species? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and as I said, planting hardwoods is is a lot, uh, there's a lot of failures in planting hardwoods. Uh, typically we rely on natural regeneration uh, in hardwoods, in growing hardwoods. They put out a lot of seed fairly frequently. Uh, you go on a forest floor in a maple stand a year or so after they put out seed and there's thousands of young seedlings. We don't have a lot of success in planting them. They're very costly, susceptible to browsing. You just can't get those numbers in. So um, I'm not sure if there's a really a right answer to that. Um, I think diversity is, is something to consider. Um, and, you know, consulting with a, you know, a, a forestry consultant or somebody is a good idea. Uh, planting the wrong species on the wrong site, you're pretty much guaranteed for failure. So uh, probably don't have a better answer than that. Uh, and it's also, it's, it's concerning. Margaret brought up a couple of, of, of forest pests that we don't have here yet, but seem to be on the move. She could have probably added several other pests uh, that people are forestry managers are concerned of that maybe not next year, or maybe it's next decade. So there's no really good answer. Awesome. Our, our last question uh, isn't actually about a tree species, so no pressure to answer it. Uh, it's about Japanese knotweed. So they've tried to manage a patch on their property, I guess, with tarps, cutting and pulling. Uh, do you have any experience with knotweed? Um, for those who don't know, it's an invasive plant. Uh, it's very aggressive and it is extremely difficult to get rid of. So, I mean, it's not something that Westwind does, Westwind deals with. It tends not to be a forest pest, it tends to be on the edge. Uh, of, of forests or in, in fields and ditches and, and things like that. So 
uh, I've had some personal experience and it's tough to get rid of. Um, I have seen in, in past vacations, even in North Vancouver neighborhoods that are very environmentally friendly where they've had signs up where they're actually going to spray a herbicide and I don't know how successful they've been. Um, it's, 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 it's a really tricky one to get rid of for sure. Yeah. In, in my research on Japanese knotweed, um, I've heard of people pouring pavement and concrete over top and it actually comes through the cracks. So um, I, I believe it takes about a decade of tarping and pulling and cutting and being very active on the management before you can actually say that you've destroyed a patch. So right. unfortunately, it's not a good news story. <laughs> I just wonder if I could just go back and revisit a question that was uh, asked earlier and it was about the gaps in the maps and how there's, you know, if, if Gypsy Moth was coming up here uh, on vehicles, there's, I, I just wanted to clarify something is that is absolutely a possibility that we can add to the population um, and certainly bring other pests and that's why you don't want to move firewood. Um, however, Gypsy moth is not new here. Those maps just show moderate to severe defoliation. It doesn't show that, uh, it doesn't say that in those white areas there are no gypsy moths or haven't been gypsy moths. I've been seeing gypsy moth for a number of years here, just at really, really low population levels. And those population levels, they're exploding the same as they are in other areas. So I wouldn't attribute the gypsy moth uh, huge increase that we're seeing this year and may continue to next year because somebody recently brought them up. They're, they're here. They're naturally here now, uh, just at really low levels normally. That's really helpful. Thank you, Barry. Um, that was all of our questions. So a huge thank you so much. Um, virtual applause for Margaret and Barry for your time today and all of your knowledge. It's so appreciated. Um, on the screen, I'm sure you've noticed our, our next two webinars in the series. Um, in two weeks, we'll be doing Birds of the Biosphere um, with Kenton Otterbein of Kilbear Park and Tiana Burke from the Biosphere. Um, very uh, locally famous bird nerds. Um, and then in another two weeks, we'll be doing a webinar on muskylunge, muskylunge muskies um, with Arunus. So that's another can't miss webinar. So thanks again to the presenters and to everyone who's joined us today for your time. Again, we will be circulating um, a follow-up email tomorrow with the slides and of course all the resources. Have a great day, everybody. Bye now, thanks everybody.